Good glowing day, Adam's Chosen, to the second video of my three-part series on my treatment of ghouls, a creature that is as much a part of Fallout as anything else. If you haven't seen my first video, check it out, since I will be referencing it, which goes through all the ghoul lore of the Fallout games that came out while Interplay owned the Fallout IP. This video is examining ghoul lore for Bethesda's first foray into the Fallout universe. So we will only be looking at Fallout 3 and New Vegas, but oh boy, is there a lot to cover. So crank up the rads, although maybe not too much. Let's try and stay human for now, and let's see what these ghoulies are all about. Fallout 3 seems to be the Fallout game that is most interested in exploring ghouls, and in trying to explore the ghoul condition more than any other game. With this game being the first to take place on the East Coast, and Bethesda's first crack at the series, we get to see how common ghouls are, what they look like, what they act like, and if there seem to be any important differences between the East Coast ghouls and the West Coast. On a macro level, there are many things that cross over, with the biggest and most noticeable similarity being that there is a tremendous amount of discrimination against ghouls. In the early fallouts, this would be shown by hostility and violence as people were disgusted by ghouls and ghouls were frequently portrayed as zombie-like, both in appearance and behavior, and sometimes they're just straight up called zombies. In Fallout 3, it is a similar story, although the discrimination goes a bit deeper because of one specific fear that permeates all communities. It is the possibility of a ghoul going feral. I want to look at that more in depth in just a moment, but this very real concern that, hey, let's be honest, it is perfectly rational, is that a peaceful ghoul, even if they are a bit ugly and a little smelly, could at some point descend into a primitive and ferocious state of mind, seemingly devoid of any human thought or logic at a moment's notice. For this reason, ghouls are forced socially and often physically away from human settlements and many seek refuge in the largest ghoul-only community in the capital wasteland that operates on the periphery known as Underworld. The name Underworld seems a bit on the nose for a group of people that don't even have noses to begin with because ghouls really do appear to be the living dead. This name though is pre-war in origin, unlike the settlement Necropolis in the first Fallout that got that macabre name after the Great War and subsequent ghoul occupation. Underworld is part of the Museum of History, and in the days before the Great War, they had a special exhibition that showcased the historical, cultural, and religious ideas regarding the afterlife and the underworld, hence why the entrance is a giant skull. Again, we have a connection between ghouls and death. The Museum of History became a refuge from the destruction of Adam's Fury on October 23, 2077, and the group of survivors that sheltered here during and after the bombings would start to ghoulify after only a short time. One Underworld dweller, Carol, is possibly the oldest resident of Underworld, as she was one of the survivors that sheltered nearby when the bombs dropped and chose to stay at the museum in the following days. She watched in horror as she and those with her, stowed away in the museum, started to slowly lose hair, skin, and transform into ghouls. It isn't clear why this group in particular ghoulified, nor is it clear why they chose to stay here, but these ghouls would form the nucleus that would grow into the settlement of Underworld centuries later. Underworld became a refuge because, as Carol put it, life wasn't pleasant for a ghoul in the wastes until they had a place that they could call their own. Carol recounts how many of the early ghouls in Underworld went crazy, to use her own words, most likely referring to them turning feral. In the adjacent wings of the Museum of History, feral ghouls infest the area, seemingly contained and isolated from the sentient ghouls of Underworld, but they are immediately hostile towards any non-ghouls who enter. Except for rad roaches. Ghouls seem cool with rad roaches, apparently. Ferals are always hostile towards everything except other ghouls, both feral and non-feral, 
This is as good a time as any to broach the subject of ferality or madness as it is sometimes called, since while the word feral is only used starting in Fallout 3, previous games had showed us ghouls suffering in a similar state. In Fallout 2, there are so-called mad ghouls that attack the player, some with weapons and mad ravings, and in Fallout Tactics, there are hostile ghouls who attack with weapons, no matter what the player's standing is with ghouls as a whole. And these all seem to be somewhere on this spectrum of madness. That is a good band name. But this isn't the full-blown animal-like ferality we see in Fallout 3. The closest example we have of the madness as portrayed in the old games in Fallout 3 is with the NPC known as Gallo, who is a sentient ghoul who lives in the county sewer mainline all by himself. Gallo appears to be celebrating his birthday, wearing a party hat, he decorated the place with freaky little gnomes, and, get this, is serving up and dining on a very specific delicacy, feral ghouls. Yes, Gallo appears to be a ghoul cannibal, and he is instantly hostile towards the player when encountered. We can see that he is more lucid than feral ghouls since he can speak. He traps his own meat, builds defenses for his home, uses a terminal and safe, has pet rat roaches, and even plans birthdays, but is otherwise a complete lunatic. You know, like that one uncle we all have. The Fallout 3 game guide says that a combination of sewer gas and solitude over the course of an unnaturally long life have brought him to this insane state. And I can't imagine that munching on feral ghouls is helping out all that much either. Perhaps this hostility and madness is a precursor to full ferality, an in-between state from functional, non-feral ghouls to the mindless creatures that everyone fears so much. Ferals not only act quite a bit different, but they look different from non-ferals as well. They are typically shorter, hunched over, their face looks even more disfigured if we thought that was even possible. Their eyes appear to be completely clouded, at least we can no longer see the iris and pupil, appearing worse than standard ghouls who have slightly cloudy eyes themselves. Ferals hold their hands in front of them, almost like a theropod dinosaur of some sort. Their long bony fingers and hands are their primary weapons as they rush targets and slash them until they slump over dead, in a way that sounds very familiar to the endless walker ghoul concepts from the ill-fated interplay Fallout 3, better known as Van Buren. The basic feral ghoul is most common at low levels, and all feral ghoul types have a similar gaunt figure with bones protruding in a dramatic fashion, while the skin appears to be mostly gone, showing the veins and what is left of the muscles and viscera underneath. They are all wearing tatters of clothes they once wore years, decades, maybe even centuries ago, and we can thank Adam above for that because the last thing we want to see is ghoul junk. One tier higher than the bog standard feral ghoul are the feral ghoul roamers, who do more damage and are distinct because of their darker gray-yellow skin. Aside from the color change, roamers can be seen either wearing tattered shorts and a shirt, or worn and partially functioning combat armor, which would seem to imply that these roamers could be soldiers, guards, or whoever else might have gotten their hands on armor before succumbing to a fate worse than death. Fallout 3 also harkens back to the previous fallouts by including the glowing ghouls, simply called glowing ones. Unlike the previous games though, we only ever see feral glowing ones. There were plenty of normal non-mad glowing ones in previous games, but we don't see a single one in Fallout 3. Another important difference between the glowing ones and the other feral ghouls, other than the steady green glow, is that they can build up a large charge of radiation, glowing brightly and then blast it out Super Saiyan style. The radiation blast deals explosive area of effect damage in addition to the radiation, and in what is a first in the series, we can observe this radiation healing other feral ghouls. For every 100 rads, approximately 1 HP is recovered, implying that physical damage sustained from attacks is quite literally reversed or healed in some way in the presence of radiation. Glowing Ones are the second most powerful ghoul type, behind the ridiculously tanky and gobsmackingly strong Feral Ghoul Reavers. Reavers were introduced in the Broken Steel add-on because Todd hates us, 
and are some of the most annoying enemies to face. Reavers are still wearing pieces of metal armor, have dark coloring, but are physically distinct because they give off some sort of green flame-like effect, no doubt linked to the radiation that has permeated their flesh. It seems to distort the air around the reaver, almost like it's giving off a bunch of heat. Like all the other ferals, they are fast and will perform lunge attacks that knock the player back the farthest of any ghoul type, but they have another unique attack as well. They appear to pull chunks of their own putrid, irradiated body and throw them at enemies, making these the only ranged feral ghouls in the game. The implications, frankly, are quite fascinating, since this kind of behavior shows higher levels of thinking than most ferals, who only have enough brain power to identify enemies, rush them, and slash them with their hands. Throwing chunks of your own body also seems like a way to slowly self-destruct, but it seemingly has no effect on the Reavers, and perhaps they are able to repair the damage that they are doing to themselves by healing from radiation. My favorite part about them tearing off chunks to throw is that if they decide to not throw the projectile because they are too close to you or something, they just shove it right back in there. <laughs> It's awesome. These fleshy projectiles can be pretty accurate, they dose the target with some radiation, and they even have a small explosive type effect that does extra damage to limbs. All this comes in one neat diabolical package that has over four times the health as a glowing one, three times the damage of a glowing one, and a perception high enough to make sneaking near impossible. I seriously hate these guys, and I know I cannot be the only one, I want to hear your worst reaver stories in the comments. The last type of ghoul that Fallout 3 introduced are the so-called swamp ghouls that we see at Point Lookout. They are much paler than any other type of feral ghoul, but their hands and feet are muddy from walking and crawling, I guess, around in the swamps. They don't have any special stats, being about as strong and deadly as the lowest level feral ghouls. They have remnants of the clothing worn by the Swamp Folk. So somehow the OP Swamp Folk are ghoulifying into the most pathetic of all feral ghoul types. Go figure. Overall ghouls look close but distinctly different from the first fallouts, where the earlier ghouls often showed severe decay to the point where we could see into their chest cavities, something we don't see in Fallout 3. I think it's fair to say that the decay is a little more superficial in Fallout 3, mostly missing skin, cartilage, and hair. But that's not to understate how rotted and messed up we know the ghouls to be. It just really underscores how gross ghouls were in earlier games. My favorite part of the ghouls in Fallout 3 is that the Capital Wasteland seems to have a particular interest in understanding them, as evidenced by multiple doctors and scientists who have dedicated their research to ghouls. And lucky us, that means we get more lore. In a very easy to miss and hard to access location near Tacoma Industrial and technically off the Fallout 3 map are the remains of a research camp around an irradiated pool of water. The researchers Isabella and Jason chose this location to observe and study feral ghouls and Isabella recorded their experiences and findings in a nearby terminal. They knew that ghouls were attracted to radiation, but wanted to know if ghouls had a preference for higher radiation sources over lower ones. After making a number of water basins of varying radioactivity, the most radioactive one did indeed attract more ferals. The ferals appeared to come out only at night, moving to some indoor location during the day when the research team would set up the experiments. Although feral ghouls seem to have lost any sexual characteristics that would help determine if they were male or female, Isabella felt like she could determine the sex of at least two based on the way that they moved. While that's not very scientific, Isabella started to get an attachment to some of the ghouls that led her to do increasingly dangerous stunts. Isabella was approached unawares by a ghoul that she had called Melinda, but Melinda didn't attack. Instead, Melinda grabbed Isabella's arm sniffed an area of her radiation suit that had radioactive resin stuck to it, and then quickly vanished. Isabella identified another ghoul, naming it Samuel and inferring that Samuel was an alpha male of the group because the other ferals seemed drawn to him, and she postulates that this is because of the intense radiation he gives off since he is a glowing one. Isabella would start sleeping outside near the research site, 
consistently forgetting to carry the pistol that Jason insisted she carry because her brain must have fallen out of her head at some point, and eventually decided that she needed to make literal contact with the ghouls again. She covered her and Jason's suit in radioactive resin in the hopes that the ghouls would approach them. Things ended poorly as their bodies can be found not far from the camp and it looks like Isabella got that contact that she was wanting. We learned some important things from this though, that ghouls prefer indoor locations, which seems to be substantiated by the prevalence of ghouls in indoor locations like the metro tunnels. Ghouls are attracted to and seem to enjoy being in and around sources of radiation like the irradiated water. There appears to be some sort of command structure amongst groups of ferals, but this could simply be a case of ghouls being attracted to high sources of radiation, of which glowing ones would be very strong sources. What is the most interesting part of this story is that a feral ghoul displayed behavior that wasn't immediately and overwhelmingly violent. Melinda the ghoul approached a human without attacking, and maybe the draw to radioactivity was stronger than the animalistic urge to kill anything different from them. In the Red Racer Factory is someone known as the Surgeon, a man who is dedicated to finding a way to mind control ghouls and super mutants. Through his work, he hopes to understand the brain patterns of ghouls and super mutants well enough to control them, and intends to sell this process or technology to the highest bidder, whomever that may be. I find this intriguing and would like to hear who you think in Fallout 3 would be most interested in this technology. The Enclave are the first to come to mind for me. The surgeon has been met with a measure of success on two counts. There are a number of ghouls and super mutants in the Red Racer factory that are not hostile towards him, and who we have come to learn have been made obedient to the surgeon through surgically implanted microchips. In addition to these chips making the creatures non-hostile towards the surgeon, there is a built-in kill switch that the surgeon can throw, causing the ghouls or super mutants head to explode. A failsafe is probably a good idea when you're dealing with man-eating super mutants, but not all of the creatures are controlled with chips. One specific feral ghoul known as Stefan is referred to as the surgeon's assistant and is not aggressive towards the player, unless they aggro the surgeon. The surgeon is always hostile, except when the player is wearing an item called the ghoul mask. A wearable mask that disguises the player as a ghoul and that fools ferals into not attacking. Now this is likely the result of a game design where the surgeon NPC is part of the ghoul group and so he is fooled by the mask and that is why he's friendly when we wear the mask because there isn't another human or sentient ghoul in the game that is fooled by it. Stefan the ghoul's condition goes beyond just non-aggression though, he almost acts like a guard, attacking intruders or unruly test subjects that pose a threat to the surgeon, showing that Stefan is not just made docile, he is obedient. This effect was achieved through a different method, as mentioned in the Fallout 3 game guide. The surgeon had drilled into Stefan's head, exposing his brain, and steadily dripped anti-radiation medicine, like Rataway, until Stefan was no longer aggressive, and started to exhibit loyalty and obedience. This is super interesting, suggesting that ghoul brains can be both controlled by electrical pulses from a controller chip, or even more intriguing, higher levels of brain function can be enabled or re-enabled by reducing the amount of radiation in the brain. It is important to note here though that this information comes from the official Fallout 3 game guide, but seems to contradict a terminal entry from the surgeon's terminal. In it, the surgeon specifically says that he was able to bring Stefan under control through the use of a microchip, not a surgical method. It also says Stefan is being kept downstairs with the rest of the ghouls, but he's very obviously not. He is upstairs with the surgeon. I don't think this is a contradiction though. Rather, I think this terminal is old information. I think Stefan was initially controlled with a chip and kept downstairs, but then afterwards had the surgical treatment and was kept upstairs for observation. I say this because Stefan definitely does not have a chip, because if the player sends the signal to detonate all chips, Stefan is the only test subject that stays alive. This implies he has no microchip and is kept loyal through another means, most likely the surgery mentioned in the game guide. As an aside, 
ambient, disembodied voices can be heard in the Red Racer factory saying the words Alhazred and Gieth, which is only heard in one other place in the base Fallout 3 game, a ghoul-infested building known as the Dunwich Building. But before that, we aren't done with these scientific pursuits. We have one more to go, and this one is a ghoul doctor that resides in Underworld, who is interested in understanding how and why ghoulification happens at all, and is said to be the foremost authority on so-called ghoul evolution. Dr. Barrows is the local ghoul doctor in Underworld, but his research side gig has him running ghoulification experiments, and he even has two ferals in containment for observation. Known as Meat and Ethel, the two ferals were residents of Underworld, until, apparently, they were exposed to large amounts of radiation, and this caused them to turn feral. Barrows regularly acquires human samples and will ask the player for such samples upon the first meeting, and he also has no issues doing experiments on unconscious humans, like Riley, the leader of a mercenary outfit who is in a coma and recovering in Barrows' clinic. According to his assistant, Nurse Graves, Barrows is also apparently working on a cure that will stop humans from turning into ghouls, or even one that will reverse ghoulification altogether. But this is met with some resistance. There are some within Underworld that object to Dr. Barrows' attempts to reverse ghoulification. They believe that humans are humans, and ghouls are ghouls, and it should stay that way. This is interesting because in Fallout 2, an entire cult develops under the promise that their leader, an intelligent mole rat, will find a way to reverse ghoulification. What is the most interesting part of Dr. Barrows and his research, though, has to do with a terminal located in his clinic, the Chop Shop. This terminal is interesting for a number of reasons, both the information it contains and the fact that this terminal appears to be bugged. Usually we would dive right into the lore, but I think it's only responsible to give the context for the bugged terminal, since it could be argued that its canonicity is debatable. The terminal itself is accessible to the player and will display three entries, although the entry titles themselves are cut off. That's weird enough, but when you try to select one, nothing will happen, almost as if the entries have zero information. This isn't the case. Each entry does have full and fairly long messages, however, a bug prevents these messages from displaying properly in-game. That would seem to indicate that they were meant to be presented in-game and contribute to the lore, but this bug persisted through every single patch, which is anywhere from 3 to 7, depending on the platform. To be clear though, the patches primarily address stability problems, quest bugs, and exploits, so it's not even clear if a non-essential terminal would even make it on the list of problems to patch out. Many people do consider the terminal to be bugged and therefore the information contained in it to be canon, and so the bugs have been fixed in most of the Fallout 3 unofficial patches. With all of that context, Barrows outright states that he does not know why ghoulification occurs, but there exists what he calls an X-factor that determines who and who doesn't ghoulify. He posits that mutations within the central nervous system, specifically the spinal cord, cause rapid regeneration of transmitters that govern cardiac and respiratory functions. He links these important mutations to exposure of radiation of 10 picometers and below, which corresponds to gamma rays exclusively which are the most energetic of all electromagnetic waves. He believes this rapid regeneration causes the prolonged lifespan of ghouls, since the body is able to get ample oxygen, but the rest of the body systems do not benefit from aggressive regeneration, and therefore necrosis can also occur, leading to the loss of skin, hair, and cartilage. According to Dr. Barrows, the brain, in particular the regions that govern higher order functions, also degenerates with time, leading the ghoul to regress to a more primal level that is all consumed by the need, the need to feed. He has observations related to glowing ones and how their glowing condition is the result of a buildup of radioactive material in the blood and tissues of the body as it's now unable to effectively filter them out. He mentions glowing ones tend to seek out other ferals that have been injured and suspects that they can heal other ferals with radiation, but he doesn't have any conclusive results. What an amateur. Even with Dr. Barrows having dedicated seven dozen years to studying ghouls, he still does not know what the determining factor is in ghoulification. With all the decent science that has been attempted to understand ghouls, there's also been some not-so-great science as well. 
A doctor working in Tenpenny Tower known as Dr. Julius Banfield believes ghouls carry disease due to radiation damaged immune systems, but admits that he's never actually examined a ghoul himself. He also believes all ghouls will eventually go feral, citing published research by his colleagues, but when he's pressed, he will admit that he should conduct his own research into the matter. This is a wise decision because should the player choose to infect the Capital Wasteland with FEV, Dr. Barrows from Underworld will tell the player that some mysterious virus is making many of the ghouls sick, and it is unusual because according to him, ghouls are immune to most known diseases. The ill-fated researcher Isabella records that it is a common belief amongst most folk that feral ghouls are afraid of the light, but she confirms that that is not true, as does anyone that has spent more than 10 minutes in Fallout 3, since ghouls can be found outdoors in the day and have no problem trying to make your day suck. Now for those that couldn't give a rad rat's butt for research, there is a massive amount of interesting lore that can be picked up in dialogue, in-game events, and through contextual clues that need to be discussed because they give us even more interesting information. I mentioned a unique wearable item called the Ghoul Mask that is given to the player by Roy Phillips, a strong-headed ghoul who is willing to do just about anything to get him and his group of ghouls inside Tenpenny Tower, the snootiest place in the Capital Wasteland. He gives it to the player as a token of thanks for assisting them, and this thing is pretty wild. Putting it on will fool all feral ghouls into thinking the player is just a fellow ghoul, making it a very useful item. How it works might give us insight into ferals, as Roy will tell us that it will keep us safe, but not to get too close to ferals while wearing it because they may sniff us out. I'm not sure if Roy means that ghouls will literally smell a difference and know we aren't a ghoul, or if that's just a figure of speech, but ferals can be heard sniffing during their idle animations. The thing is, ferals never actually do figure out that we're not a ghoul while wearing the mask, no matter how close we get or how long we stand there. So either Roy is wrong or there's something else at play. The mask itself consists of patches of something stitched together to cover up most of the face, leaving just the eyes and the mouth uncovered. Although ironically, the player's eyes and mouth will look awful when wearing this mask. The textures match feral ghoul skin very closely, so I get the impression that this is a bona fide Silence of the Lambs Hannibal Lecter inspired mask that was sewn together from several feral ghoul heads. If that is true, it might have enough of a scent to not actually tip off the ferals. I would also like to know how Roy figured this out and why no one else knows about this easy way to avoid ghouls. It seems feral ghouls rely heavily on sight to identify other ghouls, and possibly scent as well since we know that ghouls stink something fierce, a fact that is attested to by several NPCs. I find that interesting since ghouls appear to have clouded and distorted eyes, especially the ferals. We would also be incorrect if we assumed that feral ghouls never attack other ghouls because we can see one specific instance of this happening and feral ghoul attacks on non-ferals are casually mentioned elsewhere. Griffin is a smooth talking snake oil salesman who can be found at the entrance of Underworld with the Broken Steel DLC where he is hawking his amazing Aqua Cura, which is promised to cure a ton of things, most of which doesn't even make sense, but it is in fact just normal dirty water. When his fraud is exposed, he will be run out of Underworld into a wing of the museum that is infested with ferals and the ferals will attack and kill him. Is it because he is already running and panicking and the ghouls just frenzy? Is it because he is wearing a wig and ghouls with hair are vanishingly rare occurrences? We can't be sure, but Roy Phillips' girlfriend, Bessie Lynn, will tell the player casually that the ferals tend to leave them alone, implying that they do indeed sometimes have hostile encounters with them. Ghoul physiology is obviously quite different from humans. I mean, ghouls look and smell like they've been rotting for 200 years, because they essentially have. It is interesting to note though that the ghouls are said to be more resistant to the effect of chems. A ghoul scientist named Murphy is synthesizing a more potent form of jet called Ultra Jet in the Northwest Seneca Station. He tells the player he is creating more powerful forms of jet because ghouls have a resistance to the chem, yet they like to get high just like everyone else. This effect may be only isolated to jet, however, because we see ghouls drinking at the bar in Underworld known as the Ninth Circle, 
and at least one ghoul there named Patchwork is very obviously drunk. The owner of the Ninth Circle, Azrukal, also discreetly sells chems on the side and makes no mention of how they affect ghouls. Maybe ghouls are more resistant to all drugs and Patchwork just drank an obscene amount of alcohol. Or maybe ghouls only have a resistance towards Jet and nothing else. This is interesting because no such effect is alluded to in Fallout 2 where we have widespread jet addiction and large populations of ghouls. One observation that I find fascinating may only apply to ferals, and not all ghouls as a whole, but in the Broken Steel DLC when the player must use the presidential metro to try and get to Adams Air Force Base, there is an AI controller known as Margo who says something very peculiar. Margo is hooked up to a large array of sensors and feral ghouls have infiltrated a portion of the metro and they're battling it out with the automated security. The sensors pick up high levels of radioactivity, which is to be expected, but her thermal sensors do not pick up any internal body heat for the ferals. This is interesting for several reasons, and it is only reasonable to assume this applies to ferals since we get nothing to indicate that sentient ghouls have no body heat. Perhaps the part of the brain that regulates body heat, called the hypothalamus, is not one of the regions that gets preserved through the mutation mentioned by Dr. Barrows. This might make sense in other areas as well because the hypothalamus regulates hormones as well as appetite, and a non-functioning or partially functioning hypothalamus could cause feral ghouls to both stop producing body heat and also become unable to regulate and control their drive to feed. We know feral ghouls in Fallout 3 can also be sometimes found with human flesh in their inventories, implying that they eat their human victims, but they seem to hunt for other things as well. Greta, a ghoul in the underworld, will threaten those that insult her cooking, saying if they prefer, they can go hunt rats with the ferals, implying that ferals hunt and eat rats as well. Many of these attributes make feral ghouls remarkably similar in form and function to zombies, something that many capital wastelanders think as well, since they will often refer to ghouls as mindless zombies or use zombie as a pejorative, like many of the residents of Tenpenny Tower who are incredibly bigoted towards ghouls. The quest, gotta shoot him in the head, has an entire condition that gives the player better rewards if they shoot targets in the head, because the upset and vengeful ghoul known as Mr. Crowley says that most people believe that the only way to kill a ghoul is to shoot them in the head. Quote, like those old zombie stories. We can even call Crowley a shuffling, brain-eating zombie straight to his face. Although Fallout 2, and to a lesser extent the first Fallout, had direct mentions and comparisons of ghouls to zombies, Fallout 3 does it more than any single game up to this point. The hits don't stop coming either because we get the unique experience of watching perfectly good smooth skins ghoulify, giving us some insight into the process. Detonating the Megaton Bomb will result in three separate instances of ghoulification, and dozens of instances of Holy Division. Rip Confessor Cromwell. Moira Brown, the lover or hater owner of Craterside Supply, ghoulifies near instantaneously, or however long it takes for you to travel by foot from Tenpenny Tower to the freshly exploded Megaton. She had traveled to Springvale to do tests, but was close enough to the detonation that the effects could quickly transform her. Likewise, Brother Gerard is a member of a sect of the Children of Adam known as the Apostles of the Holy Light, and he will also ghoulify. He was on his way from Springvale to Megaton with the leader of the Apostles, Mother Curie III, and they both ghoulified as a result. It seems the distance from Megaton to Springvale is some sort of sweet spot where there is a chance of being spared the destructive effects of the bomb while getting enough radiation and possibly the burning of skin and hair to start ghoulification. Mother Curie did not make it out nearly as well, having become a feral ghoul reaver by the time she is encountered outside of Megaton. So it appears that it is possible that humans with some special X factor as Dr. Barrows puts it, when they are in the correct conditions can have near instant ghoulification both feral and non-feral. Some ghouls can ghoulify but not go feral for centuries as well. So there is just a ton of variability here. So what is the secret sauce to the ghoul mystery? Radiation is certainly an important component as Brother Gerard, Mother Curie, and Moira would have been blasted by a pulse of radiation upon detonation, not to mention any residual fallout. 
Mr. Crowley, who we mentioned previously, who gives the player the mission to go kill some people by shooting them in the head, was once a human himself not that long ago. Actually, the in-game lore is pretty inconsistent with his story since Crowley himself claims that the event that turned him into a ghoul happened 20 years ago. This event was a botched job that he and other mercenaries were paid to do, and he was locked into a room filled with ghouls and radiation, which caused him to ghoulify, possibly saving him from the ferals. The merc that locked him in the room, called Dukov, claims the job was 10 years ago, not 20, and that Mr. Crowley was already a ghoul before the ill-fated mission. The Fallout 3 game guide mentions the mission was 10 years ago, agreeing with Dukov, but that Crowley wasn't a ghoul until being exposed to a bunch of radiation as a consequence of the job, agreeing with Crowley. At any rate, Crowley wasn't close to an explosion. He seems to have been exposed to a large amount of radiation, and that was enough. Another man known as Desmond Lockhart, who we meet in the Point Lookout DLC, purposely exposed himself to lethal levels of radiation in a high-stakes bid to try and prolong his life in order to survive the apocalypse that he knew was coming. This was all to carry on what he calls the Great Game, which is just a group of rich and powerful people that try to outwit and kill each other. You know, as rich people do. High levels of radiation is the constant theme, and possibly being close enough to a bomb to get some shockwave and heat blast action can help get a nice sear on that stake. But there is one more interesting addition Fallout 3 has made to the lore, and it is a dark and ancient mystery. In the basement of the Dunwich Building, which is an otherwise unassuming office building, is an obelisk dedicated to a mysterious mythical being known as Oog Qualtoth. Occupying a space called the Virulent Underchambers, only the most foolhardy of all would make it all the way down to the obelisk because there are dozens upon dozens of feral ghouls that call this place home. It is not entirely clear why there are so many ghouls here, but we get some hints. A man known as Jamie Palabras ventured into the building to look for his father who had been obsessed with a mysterious tome called the Krivbekna. The tome is connected to the obelisk, and the being that the obelisk is dedicated to, but as Jamie went further and further into the depths, surviving his encounters with ghouls, he knew he had to leave, especially after he finally found his father who had ghoulified. The thing is, before he could turn tail and run, he felt compelled to grab the tome, and then had an overpowering urge to rest a bit against the warm obelisk. In the holotape recording this event, the last sentences he speaks are in the gravelly ghoul voice that Fallout 3 introduced, giving the impression that Jamie's ghoulification happened very quickly. Jamie can still be found in the virulent underchambers, having ghoulified, but he's not feral, and is the only non-feral ghoul in the whole building. He is immediately hostile though, likely a result of having gone mad from the evil presence here, as indicated by his cryptic ravings that can be heard in his final holotape entry, and his open worship at the obelisk. In the background, one can hear a mysterious voice repeating the names Alhazred and Giyath, both things we hear Jamie himself say. This is the same voice we hear at the Red Racer factory, where the surgeon is doing his mind control experiments, seemingly linking these two ghoul-heavy locations. We are left to wonder then, if the ghoulification happens because the obelisk itself is radioactive, or if there is another, more supernatural force that is tied to ghoulification. That is not the only supernatural force that may have an effect on ghouls, however, since the Apostles of the Holy Light that we mentioned before, led by Mother Curie III, have two feral ghouls within their Holy Light Monastery that are both non-hostile. The Apostles believe ghouls are enlightened beings of Adam, who have achieved eternal light and been reborn to never age, never hunger, and never suffer, at least according to Mother Curie. That statement is very curious, as I would initially interpret never hungering or suffering as being symbolic, since it has allusions to Christian scripture, but ghouls really do never age. So maybe she means all of that literally. Adam's champion is the non-hostile feral ghoul reaver, and son of Adam, that is S-U-N, not S-O-N, is a non-hostile glowing one, who according to the Fallout 3 official game guide, used to be her very own son. It isn't specified exactly how they were turned into ghouls, but Mother Curie mentions that they took in Adam's holy glow, and this could mean that they drank the irradiated aqua pura 
that Mother Curie and her followers have been making and promoting. Alternatively, there are some sources of radiation in the monastery, like radiation traps and radioactive waste barrels, and regular exposure from these may have been enough. Regardless, the fact that they have two feral ghouls, who are not only peaceful, but understand that they are loyal to the Apostles of the Holy Light, show that they have higher levels of reasoning, since threatening, angering, or attacking the members will cause the ghouls to become hostile. The Fallout 3 game guide actually specifically says their peaceful dispositions are not the result of a miracle. Rather, they just have some semblance of functioning brain matter that means that they can comprehend enough to be friendly. But what are the chances that they would have two people who were turned into feral ghouls and they are both still friendly? Even if we were to say that maybe they had made a number of people turn into ghouls and these are the only two who didn't go batshit crazy? Non-aggressive ferals are incredibly rare in Fallout 3. There is one with the surgeon, who is only that way because of a medical procedure, and two in Underworld in Dr. Barrow's observation room, but we can't even be sure if they're meant to be friendly towards the player, since the room they're in is made to be inaccessible, and so their non-aggression may be for gameplay reasons. To me, that means there really is something about these two ghouls, or perhaps how they were ghoulified that made them some of the rarest kind of ferals in the entire game. Is it an actual blessing from Adam? One of the biggest themes related to ghouls in the early fallouts, Fallout 2 and Tactics in particular, was the incredible amount of discrimination they suffer by normal humans. This often caused ghouls to prefer to live in settlements exclusively occupied by ghouls or with a substantial ghoul population. Only the bravest souls would try and interact with the human settlements, and that often did not end well for them. Fallout 3 follows this trend as well, with the largest group of ghouls found in Underworld, and it's shown to be a place for ghouls to escape persecution. Mr. Crowley, the mercenary who ghoulified on a botched job, had to leave his home in Rivet City under the pressure of discrimination and made his way to Underworld. Should Moira Brown turn into a ghoul, she will also leave to join Underworld, although she sees it as more an opportunity to see what life is like than anything else. Underworld grew from the small group of survivors into the Capital Wasteland's largest ghoul settlement, similar to the likes of Gecko in Fallout 2, but there have been attempts by ghouls to live elsewhere. Two ghouls who went by Badger and Sanders disagreed with the way that Underworld was run, and so they and a group of ghouls looked to settle the sewers and underground of Old Olney which ended horribly because the only thing that calls Old Only home are Death Claws and President Dave for like six seconds. Not all ghouls are so easily cowed though. Roy Phillips, who we mentioned, is adamant about getting into Tenpenny Tower and being treated equal to the humans there. It sets up one of the greatest quests since the player can choose to help the ghouls peacefully move in or sneak in a bunch of feral ghouls and exterminate all the humans there. The interesting thing about the mission is that even by going the extra mile by resolving things peacefully, after some time, Roy will have all the humans killed anyway. This seems to be born out of massive resentment built up over many years of intense discrimination. Should Roy Phillips and his group of ghouls be killed instead, a random encounter can occur where a group of ghouls can be found making their way to Tenpenny Tower with one of them carrying the so-called Ghoul Note. In the note, it calls on ghouls to avenge Roy Phillips, to show the world that they deserve respect, and declares that the revolution has begun. Such is the sentiment amongst ghouls. They face similar intense persecution, but there's also an undercurrent of resistance, of pushback, and a forceful and violent reaction. We don't see any of that in the earlier games, except maybe the first fallout, where the necropolis ghouls are intensely suspicious of humans to the point of violence. One unique universal change to ghouls in Fallout 3 is they now all have gravelly rough voices, both male and female. The few ghoul NPCs that were voiced in previous games didn't have such gravelly voices, nor did they seem to conform to any certain sound or pattern. They seemed just as diverse as normal humans. Fallout and Fallout 2 heavily implied with some NPCs outright saying that ghouls were the product of the Great War, a single creation event. Fallout 3 shows very distinctly that ghouls can continually be made through exposure to radiation and some unknown factor, but that although many were made during the Great War, there are many that have ghoulified much later. 
There is also an interesting dynamic between the ghouls and super mutants in Fallout 3, one that does not exist in the first Fallout, and could be argued to exist in a metaphorical sense in Fallout 2. One single individual in Underworld, named Willow, will remark on the observation that super mutants seem to ignore ghouls by saying that she thinks they do it possibly because the super mutants see the ghoul as kin. Now, I don't read too much into this, since it is a passing comment by a single individual, but the implication is that super mutants may see a level of kinship, whether that is because they recognize ghouls as some sort of mutant, as they themselves are, or because they both share some relation, real or perceived, to FEV. But that argument relies on a host of assumptions, which themselves were disagreed on between Fallout's earliest creators, namely the role of FEV in creating ghouls. Watch my first video for a more in-depth discussion of that, but Bethesda does not seem to take a position in Fallout 3, or even really acknowledge the possibility except for this throwaway comment by Willow. Willow's belief doesn't seem to be all that widespread either, since a random encounter of ghouls in the ruins of DC can be found trying to get into Underworld, but they're blocked by the army of super mutants that are nearby. In Fallout 2 and Tactics, it was a running gag that ghouls were losing body parts just all over the place, but that rather widespread joke was only referenced once in Fallout 3, where Underworld's resident drunk known as Patchwork has lost a finger and is in the process of losing his toes, which he will complain about in a drunken stupor. One of the last and perhaps most interesting additions Fallout 3 gave to the lore of ghouls is that the condition that we refer to as ghoulification appears to not only afflict humans. In Point Lookout, there is a circus bear named Ruska, who in the pre-war times was trained to balance on a red ball and entertain crowds. Over 200 years later, she is still alive and looks just like a standard Yao Guai, although she is 20% bigger than all others. Although this isn't stated anywhere definitively, Yao Guai characteristics conform to what we see with ghoulification. There is a loss of hair, their skin seems to be infected or sloughing, and they have cloudy eyes. The unnaturally long life of Ruska the Wonder Bear would imply that she may be the first non-human ghoul that we know of. Lastly, I want to talk about Harold, the man who mutated after entering the Mariposa military base, where Richard Gray mutated into the Master due to FEV. Harold had all the appearances of a ghoul, with the unique attribute of also growing a tree out of his head. Whether Harold was a ghoul was also a disagreement amongst the original Fallout creators, so he came up in the previous videos. But Bethesda has since confirmed that Harold is a unique FEV mutant. This is best shown by how he has completely melded with the tree that he was growing out of his head, to the point that it finally rooted him to the ground and subsumed his entire body. So in Fallout 3, we get an answer and an end to the question of what kind of mutant silly old Harold actually is. Fallout New Vegas was in so many ways a worthy expansion of so many things that we see or experience in Fallout 3. This shouldn't come as a big surprise, but even though so many of the developers that worked on Fallout New Vegas had direct experience in helping create the first Fallouts, how ghouls are portrayed falls largely in line with how Bethesda has chosen to portray them, rather than the original games. An interesting example to show how Obsidian takes stuff from Fallout 3, but then makes it unique in their own way, is how the developers for Fallout 3 had recorded lines for feral ghouls to shout when they would attack. These were simple words that were heavily distorted by the normal ghoul growls and shrieks that the ferals would make, and would be words like, kill, die, never, pain, again, and stop it. All things we normally say after going to Taco Bell. These lines were not ever included in Fallout 3, so the feral ghouls never say any intelligible words, but in New Vegas, they took the lines, re-recorded them, and then implemented them so the feral ghouls in New Vegas do now say simple and often hard to hear words when attacking the player. This is not too dissimilar to the trogs from the Fallout 3 Pit DLC that would sometimes speak, or the Scorched from Fallout 76, who, while very zombie-like, will also speak at times. That is one example of many where we see New Vegas making its own mark on what Bethesda established before, but the inclusion of speaking ferals is not only interesting in its own right, 
but a bit more in line with the crazed ghouls of earlier games that had no problem speaking and saying short lines. Likewise, New Vegas uses nearly all the feral ghoul types from Fallout 3 and then adds in their own specific ghoul types that can be found in specific locations. The basic feral ghoul looks and acts the same, but has a greater range of health and damage due to leveling. Feral ghoul roamers had their looks changed, they look now exactly like basic feral ghouls with their pale skin, and they no longer have their old worn combat armor. New Vegas also buffed the roamers health and damage, with the strongest New Vegas roamers having 40% more health and doing double the damage as in Fallout 3. Feral ghoul reavers are also included, but they have been modified and heavily nerfed. I get the feeling that the New Vegas devs hated these guys as much as we did, because the strongest New Vegas Reaver does half the damage as in Fallout 3 and has 70% of the health. Additionally, Reavers no longer have their ranged attack, where they throw exploding chunks of rotting flesh, and their melee strike does not knock the player back as far either. They can dose the player with up to 10 rads on a strike, but that is so much more manageable than before when Reavers were just running tanks with an OP ranged attack. Glowing ones are the most powerful variants in New Vegas, having a bit more health and higher damage than Reavers, along with their own radiation explosion attack that still does explosive and radiation damage. There are many unique variants of most of these ghoul types though, especially glowing ones. Camp Searchlight is, or really was, an NCR base in the southeast corner of the map, until a Legion Frumentarius team secretly released centuries-old containers of nuclear waste that had been sitting safely in the fire station all these years. Radiation billowed out from the fire station, quickly engulfing many NCR soldiers who were caught unawares. The Frumentari that committed the act died, as did some NCR soldiers, but a lot of the soldiers ended up ghoulifying, turning both feral and non-feral. Feral Trooper Ghouls are the weakest variants, still dressed in their NCR uniforms, but lacking any hats, headgear, and strangely enough, their boots as well. They are not all that threatening, doing about as much damage and having as much health as Feral Ghoul Roamers, the second weakest Feral Ghoul variant. There are Glowing Trooper Ghouls as well, although they are only as powerful as the weakest Glowing variant and can really only be a threat in numbers. Another extremely irradiated location is Fallout 34, a vault that the fan favorite faction, the Boomers, come from. After the group known as the Boomers left the vault due to discontent around not being able to use the extremely well stocked stores of explosives and ammunition, those that remained in the vault had a crisis that resulted in some vault dwellers trying to break into the locked armory. In the attempt, the vault's nuclear reactor was damaged, and it began to spew radiation throughout the vault. And worse still, the vault door no longer could open manually from the inside. Naturally, this led to many people dying, and the rest would turn into feral ghouls, except for a very small group of survivors. Vault dweller ghouls are the weakest and most numerous. They look exactly like feral ghouls or roamers, and have stats similar to the weakest variant of the roamers. A more dangerous variant is the Vault Security Guard, where the ghoul's pale coloring is similar to the basic ferals, but they are clad in Vault Security Guard armor, once again missing their boots. They have a big jump in both health and damage over the average Vault Dweller, with a bit more health than a basic Reaver, but almost half the damage. Vault Technicians were the sorry souls who were closest to the reactor and whose job it was to stabilize it and that proximity to the radiation turned them all into glowing ones. They have health and damage similar to mid-tier glowing ones, although, interestingly, they do not have the radiation shockwave attack like all the other glowing ones. The most difficult ghoul variants that will be seen in any great number are the vault security officers, who wear security armor like the ghoul security guards, but are glowing ones as well, having for some reason taken a lot more radiation than the others. They are very close stat-wise to the highest level glowing ones, although they do a bit less damage, and their radiation explosion damage does no explosive damage, with less radiation damage as well. The big hoss of the Fallout New Vegas ghouls is one unique ghoul, which is the Overseer of Vault 34. The Overseer ghoul is dressed like a Reaver with the haggard metal armor, but has a unique orange glow that we have never seen before. Glowing ones have only ever been green or white, and Reavers don't ever glow, 
the Overseer has a whopping 900 HP, which is only 200 off the Reavers in Fallout 3. At 100 melee damage, the Overseer does the same amount of damage as Fallout 3's Reavers, and also has the radiation explosion attack of a normal glowing one. Facing off against the Overseer can be surprisingly difficult since he is so much tankier than any other ghoul, and you fight him in the enclosed space of the Overseer's office, which is also defended by two gun turrets. Unless you're able to get lucky and he's stuck up on his Overseer desk where he can't get you. There were also a few cut ghoul variants. The Feral Ghoul Jumpsuit, which was a basic Feral Ghoul in a Robco Industries jumpsuit, as well as a glowing ghoul jumpsuit which had the same stats but was glowing. It isn't clear where these were intended to be on the map, but perhaps they were meant for a location like the H&H &H Tools Factory. The last variant is the most curious of all since it is called the Legion Creature, which uses the model of a standard Legion soldier, although the model isn't animated fully, so it moves around in strange ways, and there is a strange texture on the hands where they glow unevenly, almost looking like some sort of technology from Old World Blues. I can't even begin to think what this creature was meant to be, but it is classified as a ghoul in the game files and has the same stats as a roamer. New Vegas embraces the new ghoul philosophy introduced in Fallout 3 over the old ghoul philosophy of the older games. That is to mean we see many, many new ghouls, folks that underwent ghoulification relatively recently, rather than most ghouls having been transformed at or near the time of the Great War. Camp Searchlight is the best example of this, and although we don't know how long ago the Legion had released the radiation that blanketed this former military camp, we know it hasn't been all that long. A small unit of NCR soldiers survived, and have made camp on the edge of the radioactive cloud. But many that were caught up in the radiation died or ghoulified within a short period of time. Perhaps the best first-hand account is from Private Edwards, a ghoulified NCR soldier stationed at Camp Searchlight, and one of the only ones that is not immediately hostile to the player. He has taken refuge in a house, not knowing what to do since he thinks approaching the NCR survivors would get him shot, which it would, but also not wanting to go outside since he thinks being exposed to more radiation will cause him to go feral. He describes the moment when the radiation was released. He remembers being hit by a blast of energy and falling unconscious. When he awoke, he had already turned into a ghoul, and in his words, he doesn't know the details because it all happened so quickly. Although ghouls are immune to radiation, there is a precedent in Fallout 3 for ghouls going feral after being exposed to more radiation, since that is what happened to Meat and Ethel, the ghouls under observation in Dr. Barrow's clinic. The camp is replete with ghouls both feral and non-feral, but they are all hostile to the player except for Private Edwards. Interestingly, the player can convince Edwards to attack his former squad if you convince him that only one group will survive, the humans or the ghouls. Edwards will go and gather a number of the other ghouls, and they will all attack together, so the other ghouls can absolutely be reasoned with. They may just fear any non-ghoulified people, since the human survivors have been shooting any ghoul that they see on sight. Shooting the ghouls isn't an outright malicious act, the survivors have justified it as a necessary thing in order to release the ghouls from their suffering, but this belief might be seated in some latent, unrecognized bigotry since any non-feral ghouls like Private Edwards very much want to live. The issue of bigotry towards ghouls is certainly alive and present, but it could be argued that the NCR at this point in time is the most inclusive place to be for ghouls and humans to coexist together. In 2205, ghouls were granted a protected status within the NCR and therefore could not be legally discriminated against. Of course, that doesn't solve the issue of persecution, but it does allow for progress to be made in the ensuing years. Prior to that, in 2196, the NCR incorporated an area that came to be known as Dayglow, which encompasses the area of the glow in the first fallout and may extend as far south as San Diego, although we're not quite sure. The detailed information about Dayglow comes from the Fallout Bible, which isn't canon, but you never know if there are parts of the Bible that Bethesda will eventually confirm as canon, so it's worth considering. The Bible describes Dayglow as ghouls who gathered in and around the glow to scavenge and retrieve resources and technology that had lain unrecovered because of all the radiation. Ghouls are allowed to live anywhere in the NCR and are allowed into the military, at least the ones that have proven themselves to be extraordinary fighters, since there are some ghoulified NCR rangers at Camp Echo. 
In Freeside, ghouls seem to be treated like everyone else, in good ways and in bad ways. But ghouls are not allowed onto the Strip without a human chaperone. The Legion, unsurprisingly, is the most discriminatory against ghouls, although it is more of a general disgust towards mutants. And while we don't see any ghoul legionaries, except possibly at the end of Lonesome Road in one area, but they're not still a part of the Legion, we know that they have a certain tolerance for ghouls that live within the lands that they control because the potential companion Raoul has spent a lot of time in those lands. And another sign of greater tolerance, when the player is given the quest Wang Dang Atomic Tango, where they are requested to find a number of unique escorts and convince them to work at the Atomic Wrangler. One of the special requests was for a ghoul cowboy to suit clientele of particular tastes. And while a ghoul kink is hardly the gold standard for social acceptance, it is just one more piece of evidence that the NCR is fostering a more accepting society for ghoul and human cohabitation. Also, who wouldn't want to hear this when they got down? Fallout New Vegas brings some original ghoul characters and related lore to the table, which is best represented by a ghoul by the name of Jason Bright, who is the religious leader of a group of ghouls at the Repcon site. They have a belief that they must undergo a great journey that will take them to a fabled far beyond, which is a place of healing and rest for ghouls. Those that wish to escape the harshness of the wastes and the bigotry of humans are to follow Jason, who is the prophet of the Creator that has commanded him to commandeer some Repcon rockets to accomplish this great journey. The player can aid Bright and his flock to prepare the rockets, as does a human named Chris Haversham, who is convinced that he is a ghoul. So convinced is he, in fact, that he changed his voice to sound like a ghoul, believing that he began to ghoulify after his time working on the Vault 34 nuclear reactor when he was a vault dweller there. Chris must be left behind, because Jason says there is a lot of radiation, either at the far beyond or on the way there, and he wouldn't survive the journey. Bright and his followers also wish to bring feral ghouls with them and will get mad at the player for killing the ferals if they see it happen. Jason refers to their condition as the madness and has an attachment to them because they used to be members of his group. We help Bright and his followers, but I think it's worth considering where do these rockets go when they launch? The ghouls don astronaut suits, and the way they speak of the far beyond gives the impression that they are going to some corner of space, a distant planet perhaps, but the rockets they are using look awfully small to get into space, and the launch trajectory does not instill much confidence that they are actually blasting off into space either. Let's be honest, they're probably going to end up in Canada or something. Oh, if that's the case, I'm just going to do them a favor real quick. Just change a little here. Yep. You're welcome. Jason and his group are unique, but Jason himself stands out amongst ghouls primarily because of his voice, which is not at all gravelly, but has an ethereal echo. He is a sentient glowing one, which has not been seen since the earlier fallouts and never in Fallout 3, and he also doesn't glow over the entirety of his body only part of his skull and parts that show through his clothing actually glow, except for his hands, unlike real glowing ones who give off light across their entire body. Chris the human is also the first person we have met who is not a ghoul but is convinced that he is, which is equal parts tragic and amusing, but is yet again another unique aspect of New Vegas. In the Old World Blues DLC, there is an old and partially occupied internment camp that was built to house Chinese people called the Little Yangtze. They faced unimaginable horrors of experimentation and brutalization, and somehow through it all, a handful of them ghoulified, outliving the camp itself. Most of them are still confined to the camp because of the bomb collars around their necks, but it is a small wonder how they have survived two centuries in a camp this small. Where did they get food and water, and really any other perishable items? There are two members that have somehow managed to get out of the camp, and they can be encountered in the Big MT, and perhaps they work to get supplies to the rest that are stuck in the camp. At any rate, they are the only ghouls to be found in the entirety of Big Mountain, and so we need to ask ourselves, is their condition the result of experiments that were done to them? Or perhaps did many of them have a predisposition to ghoulification? Are Chinese somehow more susceptible to ghoulifying 
Unfortunately, these are questions we don't have answers to. More unique ghouls give us insight into the ghoul condition, like a gang leader named Andy Scab, who is in the process of trying to rob the, the Crimson Caravan Company. His criminal endeavors aren't what's interesting, rather it's the preponderance of human meat, strange meat, which is just a euphemism for human flesh in the Fallout games, and strange meat pies, which if you remember, there was a chance for feral ghouls in Fallout 3 to drop human flesh, and this is definitely reminiscent of zombie behavior. We see the very first ghoul confirmed to have facial hair in Fallout New Vegas, Grex, who is an ornery little guy, primarily because people like to make fun of his lazy eye. His character model is unique within the entire game, and making fun of his eye too many times will cause him to turn hostile. Two very interesting potential companions, Dean Domino and Rahul Tejada, were both ghoulified shortly after the Great War. We know more of Raul's transformation, which happened over an extended period of time, where he was routinely exposed to radiation, and would grow weak and feeble as his body tried to deal with it all. He didn't have a sudden transformation, but eventually ended up as a ghoul, which allowed him to travel far and experience many things before potentially becoming a companion. He also speaks of his deteriorating body, which includes his eyesight, which he says is starting to go, which can make sense with how cloudy ghoul eyes seem to be. Now, I'm not going to speak about this with any great length, but there seems to be a relation between ghouls or ghoulification and creatures known as the Marked Men. Marked Men are not ghouls, but they seem to heal and to need to be close to radiation sources in order to survive, since they have lost their skin which has been flayed off their bodies, and they are immediately hostile to anyone else. I want to cover these guys more in depth when we look at more of the creatures of Fallout, but there is absolutely some sort of relation here because of their need to be close to radiation and what seems to be a healing effect they receive from radiation. One last little factoid about the ghoul design that is used in both Fallout 3 and New Vegas was done by Jonah Loeb, and I want to mention how he created the fleshy textures because I think it's kind of funny. He apparently used pictures of chicken meat to create the ghoul textures and then added some wet layers to give it a sheen or a moist look, giving the ghouls that drip. <laughs> Man, I'm so cool. And that is where I must leave you. But look forward to an upcoming video where we round out the ghoul lore by looking at Fallout 4 and 76. What those games have added to the enormous body of lore regarding one of the most important groups in the Fallout franchise. Thank you. And a huge thank you to my new supporters, Bobby Oakley, Bubster Johnson, and Giovanni Villa Gomez, who are supporting me on Patreon or YouTube directly. Adam will bless you for helping to build his kingdom on Earth. And if you would like to bring the glow of Adam to the masses, you too can support me here or on Patreon. Just check out the links in the video description. Stay strong, my fellow children of Adam. Walk in his holy glow. Watch out for yourselves and others. And I will see you soon.